Welcome to Leader You by Black River Performance Management, where we believe work should fuel the human spirit, not drain it. In this leadership podcast, we will dive into the lived experiences of people flourishing in today's workplace and beyond. Join us to hear real life examples of experiences from our own lives and from the leaders we know and trust. Good morning, and thank you for joining the Leader You podcast. I'm excited to introduce our amazing guest. Uh, Amy Little. She is an award-winning nonprofit executive leader with over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit sector with experience in operations, financial management, human resources, and talent management. She's also a seasoned development professional with more than 12 years of fundraising, fund development, and grant writing experience. Amy has twice been honored by the Idaho Business Review as an honoree for their annual Women of the Year program and received the 2016 Alpha Gamma Delta Talent of Leadership Award. Most recently, Amy earned the recognition as one of the 50 most influential business leaders in Idaho by the Idaho Business Review. Amy currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Janus Incorporated. Prior to Janus, Amy served in a variety of leadership roles, including as CEO of the Idaho Nonprofit Center, Director of Education for Impact Impact for Rise, Treasure Valley's Education Partnership, and the CEO of the Greater Sandpoint Chamber Chamber of Commerce. In addition to her professional role, she was appointed by Governor Little to serve Idaho Commission in December 2021 and is a regional board member for Thrivent, a financial services organization, and is on the board of directors for the Boise NICE Project. Woohoo! Thank you for joining us, Amy. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. I've been really looking forward to this. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. The reason I asked you to be on the podcast today is because of the work that we've gotten to do with you and your team at Janus. Uh, we've done some some team building, um, some communication training, some motivation and talking about emotional intelligence and all the things because you know it's so important. And it's been, it was such a pleasure to get to um, know your team and work with them and continue that process of development and being a support to the people that, you know, make the change lives every day in, at Janice. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and start off with well, your story and how you ended up doing what you're doing? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. So I went to school at University of Idaho, so I'm a proud vandal. And I got my degree in secondary education. So I taught middle school and high school for a few years. And I just, I'm an impact driven person. So I want to feel as if the work that I'm doing is making a difference. And it it wasn't that I didn't think I could make a difference in education, but I had this really, I don't even know how to explain it. Just sort of like, it was a life defining experience. That's really what happened. So I taught a class called life, um, exploring life skills to seventh graders. And I had them for nine weeks at a time. So I get a fresh new crop of studies every, every nine weeks. And it was a drug education class. I was teaching, you know, children all about, you know, drugs and drug education and, and, you know, why it was bad and all these other things. And I quickly realized at that stage, just looking around and the kind of a school that I was teaching in and and the the climate that we were living in at the time that these these kids kind of knew they had that information. We'd been raising them up with dare. Dare was a big thing back then. And so I felt, you know, we need to give them a reason not to do them. So that's, that's not just like, it's bad for you or it's illegal or, you know, you could die. We needed to give them a reason um, to make a better decision. So we started, I created this whole new um, part of the curriculum that was really a service learning project for my students. And I realized a lot of these kiddos that I had were pretty, what you'd consider at the time we called them at-risk kids. Um, And the school was the place where they spent their most time, you know, five days a week till, you know, three o'clock every single day, most of their waking hours really were spent in that building. So we did a project where they had to come up with a way to make their community a better place. And the community was the school. And so I'll just say for middle schools, you never let them pick their own groups. Just don't do it. So so I I pre-assigned their groups and I would put a mix of, you know, high flyers, kind of, you know, your average every day, like let's get it done kids. And then some of the more at-risk kids. So they all had kind of a mix of students. So the idea was they weren't graded on the project. It was just something they needed to complete. Mm -hmm. And 
so I knew if I put them together like that, the projects would get done. So I quickly noticed uh, some interesting things just through observation and just walking around and listening into their conversations and looking at their projects that my at-risk kids actually were pretty excited about the project. They had some of the best ideas and they uh, really enjoyed finding ways to accomplish their goals because they were making the place they spent the most time that they probably felt the safest, the better place. So what I learned from that experience was when we have an opportunity to do things in our community and to lift others up and to show them what it means to do something for someone other than yourself, it, it makes us feel good. It makes us feel human. It gives us reasons to get up and it gives us reasons to do things and it gives us reasons to exist and be human and all of those things. And so that was incredibly impactful. They did things like paint the garbage cans. These kids felt like the trash cans were messy and they wanted them to look nice. Or when they walked up to the building, we just had these ugly old, they're still there by the way, ugly old just shrubs and they wanted flowers. So when they walked up, they felt that the school had more of a welcoming environment. They wanted to put um, quotes on the on the bathroom stalls and the bathrooms, like happy inspirational quotes when you were in the bathroom. I mean, these are seventh grade kiddos coming up with these incredible ways to make their, you know, their community, their school, a better place for them to be every day. And so that year I decided, you know, I, I feel like I've made an impact. It's hard. Public education is even more challenging than it was back then. And I felt like I needed to do something different. So I wanted to find a job working in a nonprofit where I had an opportunity to really put, I just have these weird superpower skills to work that I couldn't necessarily do in the classroom all the time. And then that's really kind of, I gave myself to August 1st of that summer to find a job in a nonprofit. And August 1st at 5 PM, the phone call came in and I got the job <laughs> offer. And I said, if I get a job offer by then, then I know that that's my path. And if I don't get an offer by August 1st, then I know my path is going to be in public education and the rest is sort of history. So I left and went and worked for, actually worked for the Boise Chamber of Commerce here, running their small business um, programs and their leadership development program. So that was my first kind of step into nonprofit and community-based work and, and, and really having an opportunity to make a big impact. That's amazing. What a great story. Do you want to share a little bit about uh, what Janice is? Yes. Oh, I have the best job. I And I always say that I've always had the best job. So Janice is a really amazing organization and our mission really is changing lives every day. We are a very large health and human service organization. We, uh, we have we serve, we have 20 programs that fit into three categories. So we work in community health, public policy, and economic opportunities. So we have 20 programs that fall into those three categories. And uh, there's, we have a statewide footprint. We, there's not a program in our portfolio that can't touch a life somewhere in Idaho, which is so cool to me that we have such a huge opportunity to make a massive impact in Idaho. So we have programs um, from, we have an early Head Start program up in North Idaho, everything in between. We have aging strong programs um, for healthy uh, senior living. We do, um, we have an Idaho out of school network program that helps in those critical out of school time hours for children who are all ages um, and stages in their, their school journey. We, one of our more visible programs that a lot of people know about is the Idaho Crisis and Suicide Hotline. So that's another program under our umbrella. So we, when we say we're changing lives at Janice, we literally are changing lives every day. And I am just so blessed and humbled to be a part of it. That's amazing. What a great, I, it's just an amazing, amazing organization. So we're here to talk about decision making. One of the leadership competencies that we've been working with with your team, um, there's 25 leadership competencies. And the one that we're discussing is decision making and I remember when we were working with your team, you walked them through a decision-making model that mm -hmm. you wanted to explain the decisions that you make and how you make them and why you make them. And so I thought, hey, that's a great, she's a great person to yeah. talk on decision-making today. So let's just get, dive right into the decision-making. What are, what are some of the 
things that you have learned over your career that have helped you to make better decisions um, and be comfortable with the decisions you've made, even when not everybody likes those decisions? <laughs> well, that I think is right there is the most challenging piece of it, right? And as leaders, so, and so, and we use the room yet and model. So, and, and it's funny because my brain has always thought about decisions that way, but I'd never had a, a diagram or a model to explain and better articulate to my team why I do what I do. So sometimes we just need to make what you would consider autocratic decisions, right? So I just need to make this decision and you don't have either the time or the opportunity, or there really isn't a need for a lot of input. And then there's also, you know, collaborative decisions. Um, and then there's also decisions by consensus. So where you're gonna bring, you know, your whole team together and you're facilitating more and letting them come to the decision. So I learned a lot about making decisions also by making bad ones. So sometimes when we make the wrong decisions and some that's, if you take the time to then reflect back on maybe a bad decision that you've made and think through, okay, so how did I come to that conclusion? What were the, um, you know, why did I, or not really why, but how did I come to that conclusion? Why I made that decision, what the, the implications were, so positive and negative. And if I could do it again, what would I do differently? And that helps inform, of course, better decision-making. And I think no matter what we do, in our careers, we always should take time to pause and reflect on things because that's how we learn when we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and also when we do make really good decisions, um, you know, being able to reflect on that and know that you follow, you follow the right process and, and everybody's happy. But as leaders, that is the hardest part is sometimes we do have to make decisions that people don't like. Mm -hmm. And, and, and also sometimes, and this is just a personality flaw. I don't always feel like or want to justify my decision because I have all of the information. And that's one thing that I have learned because I, I really respect my team members and the people that I work with. And I've had people say, I need to know the why, mm -hmm. and they're comfortable enough with me to say that. And so I learned over time, sometimes I do need to spend more time communicating the why behind the decision. And a lot of times it may not be a popular decision that I've made, but when they understand how I got there and why I didn't seek their input, it's, it's easier for them to kind of live with, I would say. Yeah, that's a great example. So what are some of the decisions that you made that you learned from the, the hard way? Oh, goodness. Uh, so, so, so many. <laughs> Um, I, so much wisdom. <laughs> so much wisdom. So much. How much time do you have? Um, you know, I think I would have to go back to my very first, my very first leadership job. So when I was living in Sandpoint, Idaho, I ended up becoming the chief executive officer of the Greater Sandpoint Chamber of Commerce. I was 35. So this was this was 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. super young, super green. And I think this happens a lot when we're young, like we come in, they've given us this responsibility and this team and this role and all of these things that we have to do. And we feel like, well, we have to, we have to have all the answers. We need to know all the answers. We need to be able to make all the decisions because I'm, I'm the boss now, right? I'm the, I'm the big cheese. I'm the big dog. So mm. it is my job to make decisions and they have to be right. And so I would say even just that, the first year in that role, making decisions and not consulting with the right people. So for example, maybe making programmatic decisions and not working with my, my program manager, for example, whose job it was to <laughs> run the program. <laughs> yeah, so I think the first, one of the first things I did in my very green role at the Chamber of Commerce was I started making program decisions about the programs that we were offering to our members. And again, I, I mean, I can make decisions, but I wasn't consulting the person whose job it was to actually plan and implement programming for our, our chamber members. Like, I'm sure that went over know. well. <laughs> you know, I will tell you, I, we are still very good friends to this mm -hmm. day. We had a really good working relationship. And so, but she was, um, she was one of those people who would kind of take things and process them and then come back to me later. And so 
I, I, she handled it better than I did, I will say. Um, but she was really comfortable saying, so, you know, Amy, I hear what you're saying about this decision. And I understand why you think we need to do that. But here's why we're not. And here's what I would like to do. So she was a really good communicator, mm -hmm. which I appreciated. And so just it made it easier for me to be like, oh, my gosh. And then I just, you know, it was the aha moment. I shouldn't mm -hmm. have ever done that. That's your job. And so decision making that also taught me a little bit about um, not wanting to be a micromanager either, not wanting to be the person that's like making all the decisions for my team and the things that they're doing. I need to trust them in their own decision making and empower them in their own decision making as well and try to model that a little bit better for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how about any great decisions that you've made that you were like, that was such, I'm so glad I made that decision. It turned out. Oh, I have a good one. And, and my team and my board at the time thought I was absolutely like off my chair. So, <laughs> so it happened during COVID mm -hmm. and this was at my old job at the, I don't know, profit center. And we, you know, that was just, and we're, and I say it happened during COVID as if COVID's like not a thing anymore. We're still kind of living through it, but things are much better. But at the time, you know, everything was shut down and, um, and funders were pulling money and we were, we were losing money and it was just, and we really were trying, you know, the community was really trying to route all financial resources towards those that were, you know, I mean, she, people were fed and clothed and, um, you know, and, and housed and all of those things, and, you know, let's, we just really need to meet our most basic needs and, and healthcare issues and that kind of thing. So um, the first thing I did, so we had the first case was announced on, I think it was March, Friday, March 13th of mm -hmm. 2020, a day that I'll never forget. And so I remember thinking, well, I need to do some financial scenario planning for this organization, because the reality is we had already, because of things that were happening, lost a $50,000 grant. So we'd already had $50,000 pulled right out from under us. So we were okay financially. I'm going to say I'm a pretty good money manager. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so, but we were fine. So I wasn't stressing about the $50,000, but I was starting to think what happens if we lose members and we have other funders pull money and, you know, all these things. So I ran the numbers. I have built up a sizable reserve fund through annual surplus, just by, again, by being a good money manager. So mm -hmm. we had a bunch of money. So I calculated if we received no more money from our members, so we had no more members paid their dues. We got no other income from sponsorships. We didn't get any other grants. I still had 18 months to, to keep the doors open and keep my team in place. So first decision I made was going to the board. We had an emergency board meeting and I said, here's what it looks like. If we receive no other income, I can keep keep the doors open for 18 months. Our people are our programs. We cannot cut people. Our nonprofits need us now more than they ever have before. And I'm confident we're still going to get revenue. I'm confident that that's not going to happen, but worst case scenario, we got 18 months. And so, so the first, that was the first, and really it was up to them to say, you know, yes, we agree with you, but the decision and the recommendation I made to them was we're just going to keep our people. Well, then, then, where they really thought I was off my rocker, what happened was then we started getting phone calls. So we, I am so proud of our work at the nonprofit center and I continue to be proud of the work that is being done with their new CEO. And um, we really, that was a defining moment for us as an organization at that time to really demonstrate our value to the nonprofit community. We doubled down, we did way more training support. Everything was free. We really wrapped our nonprofit community up in our arms and 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 really did everything we could to help them out, equip them with the tools they needed. And because we were doing such a good job with everything, we started having funders come to us and say, oh, well, do you how about how about you take this, you know, big chunk of money? And we had several of these phone calls with some pretty big funders wanting to give us a lot of money. And I said, <clears throat> you know, I I appreciate that but we're good. We've got 18 months of money in the bank. You know, we're going to be okay. You know, if you, if you have anything left, that's great. But really we have this huge fund at the Idaho Community Foundation, the COVID relief fund. There are many organizations who are struggling. You know, we really, we want to make sure, you know, we're, I know they say, put your oxygen mask on first. And I was like, but we, we really want to make sure that all of our nonprofit friends are being taken care of first and then come back to us if there's anything left. 
And I told my team, when you put people first, when you put the people that you're serving first, when you take care of those that are in your care, that are in your orbit, that are most important to the work that you're doing, it will come back to you in the end. You will reap the benefits down the line, but you've got to put people first. And I said, I put you first. So now we're putting our nonprofits first and I promise it will come back. So that's why I thought I was a little off my rocker (laughs) a little bit, but I was not wrong and I knew I wouldn't be. And by the end of the year, I think, well, I will tell you, we had uh, a surplus of about, and for an organization of our size, this was significant. It was about a third of our budget, about $175,000 in surplus, because at the end of the year, we had all these funders that said, we see you, we heard you, we saw the work that you did. We appreciate you. We know what you, you know, we know you put your nonprofits first and we're, we're, I mean, checks were coming in like crazy. I'm not even kidding. That's amazing. But we put our people first and that was a hard, it was a hard decision to make, but I had already done the legwork and knew we would be fine. And I knew what was most important And that. And again, that was one of those autocratic decisions that I made. I'm not, we're not taking this money right now and explain to the team, the why behind it and my board and it all worked out. That is incredible. What an example, a great leadership example of just trusting in your knowing, your inner knowing, and just um, knowing that doing the right thing versus yep. the convenient or easy thing. Exactly. And those are those are the harder things to do always are the, not always, but you know, the right thing versus what's convenient, what's easy, what, what creates less stress on your part. You know, we could have, we could have gone, you know, the other direction and it wouldn't have felt right. It wouldn't have felt good because I knew there's so many other opportunities for those funds to be put to good use and and helping community members who really were, you know, in such, you know, need at that time and, and really continue to be. Absolutely. So uh, with Janice, uh, the decision-making, um, that you do affects how many people? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I talk about, you know, not learning to crawl before I run. So I went from an organization with six employees and about a $600,000 budget to, I think we're at a $20 million budget, 155 employees, and I have 14 direct reports. So I went from zero to 60 in my career. (laughs) I don't know how I convinced them I was worthy of this role, but um, so yeah, so my decisions affect 155 lives every single day. Wow. And that's a lot. And I take that very seriously. And I, um, and I, I am humbled by that every day. And I continue to, in my mind, always think about the people that are impacted by those decisions. So it's my employees and it's the clients that they're serving. And so, um, I said, I think I still have it written on my wall, people first. And I just have always felt like that was, that has to be, you know, my North Star, my guiding light in decision-making is people first. I love that. So have you seen any people, well, the people that you've trained and developed and, and worked with over the years had people that you can tell really struggle with making decisions and, um, or they might make not know the difference between urgent and important decisions? You know, all the time. And I think, and especially in nonprofit work, sometimes because we, you know, especially when we're doing health and human service work, everything feels urgent. Everything feels like we have to get this thing done right now because we are so focused on on serving our clients and our community and, and helping people. So that can be extremely challenging to kind of make that differentiation and, and it's paralyzing at mm-hmm. times. So sometimes we, now we have to, we have to make a decision about which thing we're going to do or which direction we're going to go, but we're almost paralyzed because we're so focused on, you know, the, the work and the mission and the things that we need to do. It gets, it kind of slows us up sometimes. So I have seen that happen for sure. Yeah. I, I've been noticing um, a lot of, instances where people think most de- the decisions are urgent yeah. like I need to know right now or I need to be in touch with you right now because you have a cell phone you know like can it wait till tomorrow can it wait till the like is is somebody's life on the line right now these kinds of things it's 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 getting to the point where I think people are in such a panic and such a rush 
that mm-hmm. everything seems to feel urgent versus important. Like I need to have an answer for this, but you know, does somebody need an ambulance or is there really a fire or, you know, did we just run out of chairs, you know? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. And I see that all the time. And I used to, in my old job, I would say to my team, you know, remember we're not brain surgeons here. We're, we're not saving lives. So that thing can wait. And, and also I'm kind of a work-life balance nerd. So like at five o'clock, I'm trying to chase people out there, go home. You know, we're not saving lives in what we're doing. Like take a break. And, and also I, and, and in our new, in my new role though, I can't say that because we have, we do have programs that literally are, are supporting people in, in crisis every single day. Um, but what I would say to help that is to, to really sort of level set expectations. So, um, and we, we see this happen in our HR and our fiscal department. So, and I should explain a little bit the structure of Janice. So mm-hmm. this helps um, explain kind of why I'm giving this example. So Janice is, as an organization, we are um, kind of an umbrella organization for 20 programs. So those 20 programs are use our 501c3, but we at the Janus level provide HR administration, um, IT operations, fiscal, financial and accounting support, and a lot more. So we benefits administration, all those things. So we're almost like a professional employer organization for these 20 individual nonprofits that are mm-hmm. under our umbrella. So we get a lot of, so we serve 20 programs. So we have 20 programs, all of whom think that we're the only one that they're helping on any given day sometimes. And they forget, you know, we're working with other programs. So what I, we've been working through this on our team a little bit and, and I've been encouraging people, you know, make sure that you're also level setting expectations in terms of what your response times are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have what we have one team member and everything that they send in is marked with like the little red email arrow, like exclamation, like super important or whatever. And so, um, so I've encouraged my team, make sure that you're, you're ex- setting expectations for what your response times will be. And so they, some of our um, fiscal team and HR now will put a little out of office and say, you know, I got your email, I will respond within 24 hours or, or one business day or whatever. So it level sets the expectation that, you know, if you need something right away, I will get to it, but I'm busy. So mm-hmm. some of that is helping people see like, okay, so they did. And I think that's some of it too, because with our phones and technology, we're used to these instant responses all the time. And sometimes all we really need to know is that somebody heard us, got the message and they're working on it and then we're okay. Mm -hmm. But, and I think, so that's one of the things that I've been trying to help, um, help other people understand is we can also take some responsibility and then let people know like, Hey, we got your message. We're working on level setting expectations. But in terms of like which decisions to make and when, you know, that for me, that's always been a guideline. Are you barfing? Are you burning? You know, are you unconscious? Like those, like if you're in that situation, this is the thing that needs to be dealt with. But if there's, if lives are not in peril, we need to focus on, you know, the things, the other things. So I, I talk about that all the time. Barfing. I can't remember what we used to say, barfing, burning, or <laughs> boiling. I don't know, but we had this little acronym and, and if it wasn't that, then, you know, we just take pause. Mm-hmm. We will get things done. And mm-hmm. that is one thing I will say about the entire nonprofit sector is if you need somebody to get somebody something done, somebody in the nonprofit sector, well, we always figure out a way to get it done. We're creative. We, we're easily, we can easily pivot resourceful uh, we're very resourceful yeah. like we get stuff we will get things done yeah we will get things. yeah might not be emergent but it will it'll it's and important it and it's important and it's, it's important, important yeah. work absolutely yeah. so um this is a really good conversation i'm curious if you have um any books that you've read on decision making do you listen to any podcasts how do you uh build that skill for yourself you know uh, I'm more of a kind of a continuous improvement junkie. So I will say I've been, I was reading up on the broom yet model and there's a great um, graphic and an article that kind of explains it. And which has been good. Um, I do read, I do read some books, actually one book that has helped me attend. I'm not, can I show it? Yeah. So managing transitions. Mm -hmm. So 
whenever a, a leader takes over an organization, even when it's awesome and well run and beautiful and perfect, which is Janice, you're still managing a transition because you have a new new leader. So this book has been fantastic. And it does actually talk. This has been, it's kind of my Bible. Like I have, it's dog-eared. I've written in it. I have like a bookmark in here um, for my favorite section. And um, and I use this a lot because it does talk about decision-making in terms of managing transitions, whether it's a cultural change, whether it's a leadership change, whether it's a change in, um, in the, the business model, any of those things. So that's a really good book. I like the Vroom Yetten model, but I also am a person that I like to hear from people and get feedback. So I use what I hear to, to, to rethink and reevaluate how I've made decisions. So, and I'll tell you the day that, um, that you all came to work with our team for the very first time. And I was kind of talking to them about the Vroom Yetten model. So I had gotten some feedback from a number of that, those program directors at that, before that, that they felt that I was making decisions and I wasn't including them and they were kind of getting frustrated by that because they had always felt previously that they had an ability to um, to work a little bit more, you know, collaboratively um, and, and, and more with consensus. Um, and so I needed to, I needed to kind of push a pause button and explain to them, you know, I'm a, I am a different leader than the previous leadership, um, good, bad, or indifferent. I, we just have different styles and I'm not going to be like them, but what I can do is take a minute and explain to them what my process is and that I will seek their input when it's appropriate. And what was nice about that, that model was I could explain, this is literally how my brain works, but I've never been able to clearly articulate that to you all. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is how my brain functions when it comes to decision-making. And so when I need consensus, I will get it. When I need um, to get your input and make a decision, I will get it. And sometimes there will be times where I don't have time, it's not appropriate, and a decision needs to be made immediately, and I'm just going to have to do it. But I commit to explaining the why behind those decisions. So um, so I'm always learning. So a lot of it for me is just understanding, you know, how my team feels about certain things and getting their input. And, um, and I've been called out more than once. Like, why did you do that? And I love when somebody is willing to ask me why because it's an opportunity to talk and it's an opportunity for me to learn and then to reflect back and say I see I see why that appears the way it appears and I'm grateful to mm -hmm. bring that to me so a lot of it for me is yeah I read books but I feel so much that we just learn by doing and making mistakes absolutely what that tells me too is that you're building that trust and that psychological safety which is so important for them to trust the decisions that you make and understand the why and go, I know she really does have our back. Even if I don't like the decision, I can get behind it because I know the process and I know she cares. And I know when I do give her feedback, she does take it into account. And I know that about you. I mean, I've seen you in action with your team and it's like, I know that it keeps you up at night and those are the things that you, you worry about and you, you're wanting to make the right decisions. But in the end, you you know you don't like to disappoint, and you don't you don't like to, you know, make people feel like they're they're not valued. It's more it's the quite the opposite. I care, and I care this much, and this is why I do what I do. This is how I do it, and you can come to me if you don't understand. Yeah, and it takes time. I mean, I started in March, and so now it's been almost nine months. So I'm still fairly new in the role, and so it does. It takes a lot of time to to build that to build that trust and, and really for them to feel comfortable with me. And, and, and I may not get there with everybody, you know, and I'm, and I, and I might, but I do that to me, that's the most important thing for them to understand is that I do, I have their back. I care about them as people. I want to, I'm always trying to make the right decisions um, based on what's, you know, what's best for what's best for them and the team and the organization and those that we're serving. And so sometimes those messages, you know, I just have to repeat them. Um, but yeah, I, it's interesting once I introduced the model and I think I, um, I have been a lot more again, cause I take feed, I take feedback and I'll, 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 I'll make changes. So we've really been trying to make a more conscientious effort at all levels of our, of our shared services department of seeking their input on things where it makes sense to seek input and then make decisions or work with them collaboratively. And, um, 
And I think that, and that feels good. And I think they see that. So it, it'll just take time, but they're, they're an awesome group. And I, I say this, I'm so blessed to just even play a small part in, in, in supporting their work. And, um, and, and I, I, because this is such an important organization and we have such a huge, huge, massive footprint and, and service area. And I really take, um, I take all, everything that we do and all the decisions that, you know, that I have to make to heart uh, every day. And yeah, it does sometimes keep me up at night because we, you know, we, we, we do change lives every day in every corner. And I want to, I want to make sure that we're, we continue to do that. That's amazing. Well, I'd like to get to the part where we ask, what are some three words of wisdom, tips, things that you wish you'd known earlier in your career? Oh, gosh. So the first one is, I wish I would have known how challenging, um, both mentally and emotionally, being a leader really is. I did not know. So I leaders make it look easy. And then we get in that role and then we realize this is not easy. Yeah. So I will say I have really tried to bring, um, so professional development and coaching and training and developing future leaders is Mm -hmm. huge to me because I had, I had some people that did that for me and some people that didn't. And I always appreciated people that wanted to train and teach and coach me Mm -hmm. up so that I could assume a bigger role someday. So that's a huge focus for me. So I've always tried to bring people along so they could see. So when you take on a leadership role, you understand that it is challenging. You can easily identify, you know, your allies and you can, and you can find ways um, to not feel so alone because it is very, so it's mentally and emotionally exhausting. And it's also lonely sometimes to be in a big leadership role. Mm-hmm. So that'd be the one, number one thing I wish I had known early in my career is really how challenging um, being a leader is. And also what on the flip side, so the hardest things can also come with their greatest blessings. Right. And so, um, so I think it's important to know that it's hard work, but it's also it's a huge blessing to, mm-hmm. to, to be a leader, especially a leader of a nonprofit and, and be able to make an impact. Um, I also, gosh, there's so many lessons learned. Um, I think, Another one, and it does get back to that decision-making piece of it. So, you know, I talked about when I took over the Chamber of Commerce and just kind of came in, new sheriff in town and, you know, making all the decisions. Like, I wish I, <laughs> wish I would have, I wish I would have known I didn't have to make this at all, all the decisions. Leaders don't have to make all the decisions. You have a team full of bright, thoughtful, articulate thinkers that you can tap into Mm -hmm. and so there's layers to decision making you don't have to make all of them and empowering people to provide input and make decisions and coach them up and support them I think is is something I wish I had known earlier on and I and I'll say this um again that professional development thing I really try to hire good people or in this case I've inherited good people Mm -hmm. just Get out of their way. Let them be awesome. Mm-hmm. Get a roadblock out of the way if they need it. Be a good thought partner. Help them when they ask for it. But don't, you know, don't get in the way. Empower them to make their own decisions. Support them when they're right or wrong. Make sure they know that you have their back. And so I wish I had known those those pieces of decision making and and what that looks like when you have a team. Because again, I just thought I had to make all the decisions, and you don't. Mm-hmm. Which is nice. Yeah. What, and that's exhausting, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, empowering people to make decisions at their level and supporting them in doing so and coaching them on how to like look at the bigger picture is a skill that will carry that person through their whole career because every time they take a step up and advance in their career, when they have that basic skill, they're just going to get better and better and better and it's just going to serve them well down the line. So I think that's that's another lesson. Um, and then I will say work-life balance is probably, when we talk about this all the time, um, and, and I, I used and really work-life balance, but also walking the walk and talking the talk goes hand in hand. So I learned that if I told my team, I don't want you to check your emails when you're on vacation, but I check my emails when I'm on vacation, it sets the tone that I expect them to check their emails while they're on vacation. 
So I, and I preached for a long time, work-life balance, go home at five o'clock. Well, guess who was still at the office till six or seven? That was me. Um, and that's my job as a leader. You know, I, I, sh- I make the big bucks. I'm, I should be working harder, faster than anybody else on my team. Um, and, and, and really, and that is around supporting them and helping them and making sure they grow and, you know, on all the other responsibilities that comes with being an executive director, CEO. Um, but work-life balance, I think I didn't do a very good job of it. And when I was at the chamber, I had little kids. I changed my son's diapers on my desk. My team still tells me that story about when he was two and I had to change his diapers on my desk because he got sick at daycare. It was a whole thing. So, um, so work-life balance is important. So for me, having always been a working mother, I always am supportive of flexible scheduling, Mm -hmm. flexible flexibility for my team those sorts of things, but also at every opportunity, I will always try to encourage my team to make sure that they're trying to find some balance. And so one little thing that I like to do, so we always set goals, you know, at work, we set goals like next year, I want to accomplish these three things. Well, I always ask my team, that's great to set professional goals, but I want you to at least give me one personal goal. Like what's one thing that you're going to do to take care of yourself this next year, because you need to do that Mm -hmm. at the same time. And I started doing the same thing. So I started setting some like personal goals in addition to my professional goals to take care of myself. So work-life balance is important, but we as leaders have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And there's little things that we can do to make sure that we're modeling the behavior that we expect. Because if we model, we don't model the behavior that we expect, we're going to get what we're doing. Mm Mm-hmm. And not what we want to be. I love that. I've been recently hearing some CEOs to say things like, I don't have time to read a book. I don't have time to listen to a podcast um, and, you know, to continue to grow. And my response is generally, you really don't have time not to. Yeah, you. We all have time. I mean, this one, when I'm traveling, because I'm too, I'm too, I will say, fiscally responsible to pay for Wi-Fi on an airplane. <laughs> I read books on a plane. I don't buy the Wi-Fi. I read books. Mm-hmm. I have a giant stack next to my night on my nightstand next to my bed upstairs of books to read. So we have time. Also on the plane, you can download podcasts. You can listen to them in your car on the way to work. Like there's, you have, we have the time. It's just a matter of prioritizing and finding it. Absolutely. My cl- my car is my classroom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm listening to podcasts or I have, I have Audible. Um, yeah, I, I love to sit and read a book, but I, I definitely don't have as much sitting around time as I used to. But if I'm stuck, I do have a book with me to read if I'm on an airplane or if I'm going someplace. And I love to have a hard copy that I can highlight and all yeah. that stuff. But I, I do can never give this book away. Yes, it's I'm buying it today. And that's going to be one of mine that I'm going to buy the hard copy so that I can keep notes. That's the kind of book you want to keep notes in. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. The only, and I will say like, I try not to read anything too heavy before bed. Cause this is what, this is me like at 10 o'clock. Yeah. So that's not the best time to read, you know, work type things, but yeah, we have time. We just have to carve it out. We have to find it. We have to figure out, you know, when, when we can do it. And I, I used to joke, I don't even have time to read my email. And that sometimes is true, but um, so I find the time to do it, but yeah, we can always find time. And I think, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. I just completed my my MBA in September. So while I was learning this new job, I was studying like 10 hours a day on Saturdays and Sundays and two, three hours a night um, trying to finish that up. But I'm a lifelong learner. And I think also modeling, I think that's, an, okay, so I'll pick up four things. That's a four thing, but modeling that we are always learning and growing for our team is important. Like just because you become a leader doesn't mean that you have to stop learning you have to keep learning and growing because your team changes, the work changes, the programs changes, there's always changes. And if you stay the same, you can't keep up, you can't support, you can't, um, you can't be an effective leader because everybody, I mean, we did, we worked with you for two days and just learning how different everybody is on your team. And if you don't keep learning, you can't serve them. That's so amazing. You're an incredible leader. And I think that you know, you're doing amazing things across our state. And I'm just so grateful for the work that you and all of the people at Janice do to serve Idaho families. It just, that just warms my heart so much. It kind of brings tears to my eyes because I, I mean, I, I got to see them firsthand and get to know 
how important the work is from the suicide hotline to, you know, getting kids in preschool and all the things that you're doing to just make a huge difference. And so your work is not unnoticed. I'm so grateful to know, to have the opportunity to get to know you, to be able to be trusted with your team and just, I'm just happy that you gave us the time. And I want to thank the listeners too today for, um, either look, watching the video or listening to this podcast. Um, and if you don't know anything about nonprofits, I think this is uh, a really great one to learn about and to know about because they're making so many changes and so much positive impact on our state and our people. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Amy, for joining us and keep on changing lives every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.